Okay. So today's topic is specific latent heat. And it's something that we have talked about and which you are probably already aware of is the fact that during phase change, so that's, you know, um, gas to liquid or, or back again, and, you know, liquid to solid and back again, uh, that substances undergoing a phase change uh, stay at one set temperature. Okay. Um, so the one that we're probably most familiar with is water. And if we were to look at, you know, um, what happens with water, you know, as we're cooling or, or, or heating it, okay? So if this is time, so this is temperature, um, what we'll notice is that water will hold temp during phase change, and that happens at um, some specified temperatures. So I'll just make a little graph of this. You see what it looks like, and then we can talk about it. Okay, so down here, water's in its solid form. We call that ice. And ice changes phase at zero degrees Celsius. In fact, that's why zero degrees Celsius is zero degrees Celsius. It's defined by when water is changing phase. Uh, here it's liquid, so liquid water. And that happens between zero and 100. And then at 100 degrees, um, we get uh, vaporization or we get water turning into steam. Okay, so above here, it's steam. So what we're interested in when we talk about latent heat is what is happening at these plateaus, okay? Um, so if you recall, temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy, I guess, of the particles in the substance. Uh, okay. A little bar over top just means average of particles. Um, so the question is then, during let's let's say we're going in this direction. Let's say we're heating this up rather than cooling it down. Okay. As um, ice is melting, would you say that that is an endo or an exothermic process? Does heat have to go in here, or does heat have to come out of it as we're melting? Endo. So in other words, we have to put heat in, right? So heat has to go in here, and heat has to go in here. Okay. And what that also means is that as water is cooling and turning into into ice, all right, it has to give off heat. Okay. Um, and what's going on is intermolecular bonds are either forming or being broken, um, depending which way you're going, during a phase change. So energy is not involved in increasing the kinetic energy and therefore the temperature of particles. It's involved in other processes, um, uh, so like like bond forming, right? Um, okay, so during phase change, Uh, heat is not um, influencing EK, right? It, it is um, involved in making and breaking bonds. All right. Um, the exact nature of that isn't really super important to us, um, but the mathematics of what goes on there um, is. Okay. So let's do our little formula that we're going to use to talk about this. So Q equals m uh, times L, where Q is heat energy. M is the mass of the substance undergoing phase change. And L uh, is the specific um, latent heat constant, or 
goes by different names, but we'll call it specific latent heat constant. Okay, you'll note that there's no temp um, temperature value involved here um, because that is specific to the type of substance that we're talking about and therefore is taken care of in the value for L. Um, I should say, because there's no temperature change, we don't have to consider it during during a phase change. Okay, so let's let's do an example here. Um, uh, so, um, latent heat of vaporization. is the heat required to vaporize a substance. So for water, that value is um, 2.27 times 10 to the 6, so 2.27 million uh, joules per kilogram. Now you'll notice that that's significantly higher than the specific heat of water, right? It's, it's a 4,700 and change, or 4,800 roughly, per kilogram. So we're basically two orders of magnitude higher. Um, so in other words, it takes two orders of magnitude um, more energy to vaporize a kilogram of water than it does to raise it a degree Celsius. Okay, does that make sense? Um, and we'll also look at ethanol, we'll compare it with ethanol, and would you expect, from your experience with chemistry, um, would you expect that ethanol would have a higher or a lower value for this? You think it'll be lower, okay, absolutely, it'll be lower. I, I don't know, if, I guess we'll consider it way lower, because it's an, it's an order of magnitude lower, actually, so, um, or, or uh, it's not quite a full order of magnitude, but close. Okay, so it's, it's, it's quite a bit lower. Um, also, the temperature at which water is vaporized is 100 degrees Celsius, um, or about 373 Kelvin, whereas uh, this happens at 78 degrees Celsius. Okay, do you think there's a tie-in as to the temperature that vaporization happens at and the value for this number? Would it make sense that there might be some sort of tie-in between the two? What do you think it is about water that gives it such a much higher uh, latent heat of vaporization than ethanol? Okay, yeah. So if we draw, if we draw, just we'll take a little detour here. If we draw what what uh, water looks like, okay. So we have oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen. And if you take chemistry, you know that Oxygen is electronegative, in other words, it has a strong attraction for electrons, and therefore it becomes a polar molecule. So part of the water molecule is negative and part is positive. Not only that, if you think about a hydrogen uh, atom, a hydrogen atom only has one electron on it, right? That electron will reside very close to oxygen, right? In other words, this hydrogen hanging out here off water behaves much like a bare proton would, okay? And when this is exposed to other water molecules, you can imagine that there's going to be a strong attraction here between the two. Now, it's not a true chemical bond that forms, uh, but it's about as close as you can get without being a real bond. That's called hydrogen bonding, right? So in the liquid phase, um, you know, hydrogen bonding is, 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 is happening in water. And in order to turn water into a gas, you have to provide enough energy to break apart these bonds and separate these water molecules that are sort of clinging together. Okay? Yes, question. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Right. Doesn't it what? Well, without getting too much into into chemistry, all right. Um, as you go from left to right along the periodic table, um, the size of the of the of the nucleus 
um, gets larger, well, it gets more positive. And then what happens is there's more attraction for the electrons that are in orbitals. And what that does is it effectively shrinks the size of molecules, or so, sorry, the size of atoms. So as you go along the periodic table from left to right, by the time you get to oxygen, it's a very small atom, okay? Um, yeah, very dense. And the outer shell electrons are quite close to the nucleus. And what that does, and, uh, and anyway, and what that does is it, 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 it allows the, the positive to, you know, I guess emanate out into space. I don't know if I'm explaining this quite right, but nearby electrons get pulled into this sphere of influence, right? They, in other words, if we were to think about this bond, they spend most of their time close to oxygen rather than out here, right? Because they're pulled towards it, electrically pulled towards it. So that's where you get this polarity from, okay? In, in ethanol, ethanol is a little bit different. Although it's not like totally outrageously different, um, it is different. So ethanol has two carbons. Uh, on one of the carbons, you have a hydroxide group. Okay, and on the rest, you just have hydrogen. Now, this OH group um, can, to a certain extent, actually also do a little bit of hydrogen bonding. It's not quite to the same extent as water is. Um, there's this attached, which is nonpolar. Um, but overall, ethanol would be a slightly polar molecule, so there is some in intermolecular force. And we can see that, okay, this is, this is high. It's not quite to the extent that water is, but it's still a fairly high um, attractive force. If we were to look at something that is completely nonpolar, um, like, for instance, like, let's say methane or, or, or something like that, well, you know, if you put some of these near each other, there's virtually no attraction between them besides van der Waals bonding. Uh, and in such a small molecule, that means barely anything. And then if you take it to, to its extreme other end, uh, in terms of non-attraction, if you think about a helium, well, it's got a full, completely full outer shell. And really, it's a very small molecule. The amount of attraction between two heliums is very small. So, you know, essentially the, the gas or the vaporization point of helium is going to be just a few degrees above absolute zero, right? The helium becomes a gas. And let's just double check on that. Oh, dare I? I, I dare not. Can someone look on their phone and just find me? What is the vaporization temperature of helium? And while you're at it, methane. Someone do methane. Max, can you do methane? Because it's nice to just put a number on these things just to compare. We'll just wait while those guys find that. So vaporization temperature, uh, you, could just, you could just put it at uh, boiling point if you want. Boiling point of helium and boiling point of methane. Okay. Okay. So, so really, not like four or five degrees above absolute zero, right? And it's already become a gas. And and you can kind of see and 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 sort of try to make sense of why these things happen, right? Lots of attractive forces here. It takes lots of energy to break those apart. Um, can you also find the specific late? latent heat of vaporization of helium is that available can you find that for me because that number is going to be very very i think very small at least compared to this it will be small is that available if it's not that's fine um just late, late just you can just probably put heat of vapor or heat of um yeah heat of vaporization probably it will be available i think you can just look for it Heat of vaporization is in terms of how many joules per kilogram of substance worth of energy you need to put in to vaporize it. The temperature is the temperature at which that phase change happens. Okay, that's the temperature that this happens at. But can you find me this equivalent value, the latent heat of vaporization of those substances? Is that available? Can you find that? Yeah. 20.7 kilojoules. Okay, so times 10 to the 3 joules per 
kilogram. Okay, perfect. That's that's good enough. Um, compare that with water and ethanol, right? Major, major difference. I think it's important to understand and to be able to predict what these values will be and why they are what they are. Is that a good explanation? Okay, awesome. That's all we really need. Um, so we would expect then something like um, like methane to also be, you know, fairly low. It's not going to take nearly as much energy to, to break the bonds between liquid helium to make it vaporize. Now, we're just talking about vaporization right now. The same thing happens, though, from solid to liquid as well. Okay, the same principles apply. The actual values of these numbers are different, and the temperatures they happen at are different. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there you go. So let's try, um, let's try a problem here. Um, find the amount of energy. Required in order to um, boil 50 grams of ethanol um, at its boiling point. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. The amount of energy is just going to be Q times the mass times the latent heat. Um, so in terms of kilograms, we've got 0 0.050 kilograms. And you just got to multiply it by its specific latent heat, which I believe is 8.55 times 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram. And you should come out with a value of about 4.3 times 10 to the 4 joules. So that's how you use a specific latent heat um, of either vaporization or fusion, okay? And we'll make a note of that. So L for boiling, that's called the latent heat of vaporization. And L for freezing, called the latent heat of fusion. Fusion is in fusing together from liquid into solid. Um, let's, try, let's try another one here. I'm going to let you guys work on this one. It is, um, okay. So 50 grams of water and 50 grams of ethanol. Um, are placed in calorimeters um, with 100 watt heating coils that are known to have Eighty percent efficiency. And I'll draw a picture of this in a second. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see here. If both start at room temperature. of 20 degrees Celsius. Don't worry, I'll scroll back down in a sec. Calculate the time to vaporize both substances. So you'll get, so you get two answers, right? You'll get the answer for ethanol and you'll get the answer for water. So what I'm, what I'm talking about here just imagine we have essentially an insulated vessel of some sort. Okay. And into here you've got a heating coil placed. And you're running you're running heat in here at a power level of 100 watts. All right? And you've got two of these set up, one with each liquid, um, both starting at 20 degrees Celsius. So I want to know if there's 50 grams 
of substance in each of here, in each of these, how long will it take to boil? Now, you need to boil it all away to a gas, okay? Now, you have the specific late, uh, latent heat of vaporization. You have the boiling points of the two, of the two liquids. What other information do you need? What, what information do you not have at this point in time in order to solve a problem like this? So let's just think about what's going to what's going to happen here. So if this represents ethanol, its temperature is going to rise to its boiling point, right? And then vaporization is going to happen. So you have to get it up to its boiling point first from 20 degrees, right? If it starts at 20 degrees, you got to get it up to its boiling point of 78.3. So what information are you missing to know how much energy that's going to require? What do you need to know? that we haven't talked about yet. And, we, and we're going to have water too. I'm not sure if water will follow the exact same curve, but we know that water is not going to boil till we get up to 100 degrees Celsius. So let's talk about water first then. To get water from 20 degrees to 100 degrees, what do you need to know in terms of how much energy is required? Right, exactly. Q equals mc delta T. So you're going to need to find, you need to go online to find this, the C value, the specific heat of ethanol, okay? Because you have to know how much energy it takes to get it to its boiling point in the first place. Then that has to be added to the amount of energy it requires in order to vaporize it. So the steps, I guess, that you need to know is energy to get to temp. You need to know energy to vaporize. And then you need to apply that, you need to find time based on power. Okay, so I'm going to pause it there and we can work on this. Okay, good, it worked. Um, all right, so we have some time to work this out here. Um, hopefully, if you're watching this video, you just pause and try to work it out on your own. Um, but let's just, you know, let's just think about the, the, the how we're going to go about doing this. So we need to know ethanol's specific heat, so the C value for ethanol found online is 2.46 joules per gram per Kelvin degree, and for water, sorry, we already know is uh, 4.18 joules per Kelvin. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll find how much energy it takes to raise ethanol from 20 to 78.3. So Q equals MC delta T. I'm just putting sub E so we remember what we're talking about here. And for that, we've got 50 grams for a mass. We've got this value for the specific heat. So each degree in temperature requires 2.46 joules. And we got to put delta T um, which is in this case 78.3 minus 20 and if you do your math right you can leave I have you get 71.70.9 joules to do that and then we'll do waters so same amount of substance or same mass of substance but different specific heat and we got to go higher in temperature with water uh, in order to get it up to the value that we need. So it's got to go up 80 degrees versus uh, uh, ethanol only having to go up to 78.3. So 16 and 32 joules. Okay, so this is the amount of energy required just to heat them to their respective vaporization temperature. Okay, then we got to talk about the actual energy required to vaporize it. Vaporize each one. So vaporization for A for ethanol ML, and um, so I just I did my conversion on the uh, on specific heat. You cannot put in 0 0.05 kg. I I just I just converted it right on the specific latent heat value. Just teaching. Uh, 
So what you get for this is 42,750 joules for that. And for B, do the same thing for water. The specific heat for water is 2.27 times 10 to the 3 joules per gram. And that should give you 113,500 joules. So then we want totals, right? So Q total for ethanol, is those two values added together. Um, so you've got your energy required to get it up to temp, plus your energy required to vaporize. And you get 4.99 times 10 to the 4. Little interruption there. Um, okay. Uh, now it won't write. Honestly. Okay. Well, it stopped being able to write, so we got interrupted, and uh, unfortunately, we can't finish. Um, what you would get for water is 1.3 times 10 to the 5. Can't write that down. And then, so that's the total amount of energy required. And then all you got to do is you got to use your power formula, which is uh, power is equal to energy divided by time. Um, rearrange that to time is equal to energy divided by power. Right? Divide each of these values that we talked about um, into their respective values, and that will give you the time it takes to heat them up. Of course, remembering that we said it was 80% efficient. So what you should get at the end is for ethanol, 623.8 seconds. Um, which works out to about 10 and a half minutes. And then for water, 1,625 seconds, uh, which then works out to be 27 minutes. Okay, so 10 minutes for ethanol, 27 minutes for water, if you've done your math right. Sorry about the interruption.